All right, we're back. We made it back, everybody, once again. As always, welcome. This is the Baked and Awake podcast, and I'm your host, Steve. I believe this is episode 110 of the show, and at the time of this recording, it's pretty early in the morning on October 31st, 2020, Halloween. this is your first time listening, I like to let people know, most of the time I try to let people know right up top, if you haven't figured it out already, Baked and Awake. We smoke a little bit of the reefer on this show from time to time, rather often if you really want to know the truth, so keep that in mind if you're at the office and not listening on headphones, for example. If you're at the office right now, listening to the podcast, I'd love to hear from you. Tell me what sector you're working in, what part of the world you're in, that you're still allowed to go to work. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Talk to us at bakedandwake.com is the email address to use to say hello and let me know about that. What we have for you today is a story I've been working on for over a week intensively and been thinking about for a little longer than that to be really accurate I've been thinking about doing this story since before I published the first episode of the podcast I really have Um, it came up and made it onto my earliest lists of topics of things to tackle and for various reasons I've put it off probably considered not doing it here and there partially because it's been covered so much throughout history. It's one of the first mysteries and conspiracies rolled up into one that many of us here in the United States of America, anyway, are presented in our elementary school history classes as an enduring mystery. Some of you will already know what I'm about to talk about. You just stay put. Don't you move. This mystery uh, of one very well-known lost English colony, that of Roanoke Island, it's, in my opinion, both a ghost story, therefore fitting for a show released on the Halloween holiday, the height of spooky season, as well as, to my mind, a compelling example of competing versions of history that can be found not only here, but in so many stories we have preserved and related as facts throughout human history. I'm about to share with you a whole bunch of very well-documented details that I nevertheless doubt you've heard anywhere else. As I've indicated, this is a story many, if not most of you, think you already know. I undertake today to at least tell those of you in that camp a little bit more than you knew before. Maybe a lot more. And for those fortunate enough to be learning about the Lost Colony for the very first time today, I welcome you most warmly of all. And I promise to treat this opportunity of telling you this tale as the honor that in many ways it is. As always, I'll remind you that there are detailed show notes for every episode of the podcast, and I usually include just about every source that I cite during the show so that you can perform your own research to your satisfaction should you care to investigate further. Once again, talk to us at bakedandawake.com is the email to use. If you want to get in touch, talk further about any questions you have or for anything else, really. Now, in order to do this Roanoke story any justice whatsoever, we're going to have to use my personal temporal panopticon, otherwise known as a 
2018 Mac Mini with two thrift store displays and a just decent broadband internet connection. We will use this magic mirror in order to peer into the mists of time. And since this time machine is so powerful, we have the opportunity to not only travel back to 1587, the year of the founding of the famed Lost Colony, but indeed to two years earlier, when the first colony at Roanoke was founded, only to be abandoned in nine months or so. But really, why would we stop there? Because even in 1585, there were more colonies in North America at this time, and expeditions, also known to you and me today as raiding parties, more of those than I can easily count, so much so that we'll actually come back to this point in a few minutes, after we ever so briefly take a moment to remember, and to a small extent name, the existing long-time inhabitants of the lands in question, which were, at the time of this particular moment in history, already subjected to a persistent, decades-long campaign of trading, raiding, and, yes, enslaving of the indigenous people of North America for the enrichment of themselves and their equal parts English and Spanish patrons back in Europe with an eye to completely acquiring said lands in time while subduing the people of those lands. This destiny and mission was laid out from just about day one, as far as I can tell, looking into this history. This episode promises to be a long one, for sure. So I'm talking, plug your phone in, grab a cup of tea, roll something extra frosty up, probably pack a backup bowl for that because the ride is long and bumpy and it ends in the pages of an analog paper book from the 1970s that I found on my own bookshelf that I just knew, somehow I knew it would have a little tidbit for me and that book did not disappoint. So to get there, we start here. I try very frequently to use extremely mundane mainstream sources. Today in 2020, the state of online research that's not sequestered behind, you know, uh, circuitous academic gatekeepers of different kinds, that is to say the, the public web, the light web, such a source as Wikipedia today is frequently referred to by many researchers besides myself and will be chosen first in any attempts to critique, dissect, or debunk any sort of research or speculations, suggestions, theories that I somebody like me comes up with. We're in well-trodden ground with Roanoke. I don't need to come up with any new theories or speculations. By the time we're done here today, we're all going to know exactly what happened at Roanoke, and we'll probably pass down our version of that truth to others when it comes up and the opportunity arises in our lives in the future. As I said, however, in the late 1500s, at the time of the beginning of colonization by Europeans, they were visiting a continent that had a long and storied history of not only populous existence of people, but that of established, rich, 
cultures, societies, civilizations, if you will. We jump to an article on Wikipedia entitled The Pre-Columbian Era to underscore this understanding. Now, for our purposes, we won't go so far back in our time machine as the Archaic Period, which consists of a Middle Archaic and a Late Archaic Period. But we will briefly touch upon the Woodland Period, which, as you'll see, I think is a great place to start. The Woodland Period, according to our Wikipedia article here, the Woodland Period of North American pre-Columbian cultures lasted from roughly 1000 BCE to 1000 CE. BCE and CE, quick reminder, before Common Era and Common Era, so this would be 1000 years BC to 1000 years CE is a 2000 year period or era. The term was coined in the 1930s and refers to prehistoric sites between the Archaic period and the Mississippian cultures. The Adena culture and the ensuing Hopewell tradition during this period built monumental earthwork architecture and established continent-spanning trade and exchange networks. In the Great Plains, this period is called the Woodland Period. The period is considered a developmental stage without any massive changes in a short period. They go on to tell us that it was bone work, leather working, textile, a beginning of a transition to a future lifestyle that would possibly set the stage for a more sedentary lifestyle, but these are still mobile, seasonally migrating uh, people and tribes that nevertheless would stay seasonally long enough to leave behind architecture that is still found in remnant form to this day, despite a massive campaign to erase it from the North American landscape in later years. The woodland period gives way to the first culture that is sort of named in North America, that of the Mississippian culture. Super side note, I find that wonderfully uh, synchronistic, I guess, being that one of the last uploads I made to my YouTube channel had to do with the New Madras earthquakes of 1811 and 1812, which greatly impacted the Mississippi River Delta. In fact, changed the course of the Mississippi permanently in ways that it can still be uh, seen to this day. And uh, this Mississippian culture is obviously named for their deep connection to the Mississippi River in this way. So it's fun stuff. If you don't know, I have a YouTube channel as well. Often create content that supports the podcast but is distinct from the podcast just for YouTube. It's called Baked and Awake, just like the show, uh, just like the podcast is. So love for you to check it out anytime. YouTube is my most responsive platform in the form of the readiness of access to your comments, etc. cetera. Um, get the most feedback there of anywhere. And uh, the conversation I had about the new Madras earthquakes of 1811 and 1812 was with uh, two other really wonderful uh, Mudflood and Grand Tartaria researchers, Andreas Exertus and Philip Drujinin. Uh, it was a great conversation, a little over an hour long. The guys had amazing feedback on the talk that we looked at about the New Madras earthquakes. Um, the Mississippian culture here, once again, named for the Mississippi River that was central to both these stories. Um, case so check it out youtube that's what i'm saying all right so the Miss mississippian people to get back on our topic uh 
One of the distinguishing features of this culture was the construction of complexes of large earthen mounds and grand plazas, including mound building, mil, mound, mound building traditions of earlier cultures. They grew maize and other crops intensively, participated in an extensive trade network, and had a complex, stratified society. The Mississippians first appeared around 1000 CE, following and developing out of less agriculturally intensive and less centralized woodland period. The largest urban site of these people, Cahokia, Cahokia located near modern East St. Louis, Illinois, may have reached a population of over 20,000. Other chiefdoms were constructed throughout the Southeast and its trade networks reached to the Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico. At its peak between the 12th and 13th centuries, Cahokia was the most populous city in North America. Larger cities did exist in Mesoamerica and South America. Monk's Mound, the major ceremonial center of Cahuica, Cahokia, excuse me, remains the largest earthen construction of the prehistoric Americas. The culture reached its peak in about 1200 to 1400 CE, and in most places, it seems to have been in decline before the arrival of Europeans. A little bit more on the Mississippians here. Many Mississippian peoples were encountered by the expedition of Hernando de Soto in the 1540s, mostly with disastrous results for both sides. Unlike the Spanish expeditions in Mesoamerica, who conquered vast empires with relatively few men, the de Soto expedition wandered the American Southeast for four years, becoming more bedraggled, losing more men and equipment, and eventually arriving in Mexico as a fraction of its original size. The local people feared much worse, though. The local people fared much worse, though. As the fatalities of diseases introduced by the expedition devastated the populations and produced much social disruption. By the time Europeans returned a hundred years later, nearly all of the Mississippian groups had vanished, and baths Vast swaths of their territory were virtually uninhabited. We've long been told about the impact of European germs on the existing populations of North America. It would appear from narratives such as this, that the Europeans that came in the late 1400s through the middle 1500s, here De Soto's noted in the 1540s, brought with them smallpox and influenza and some other diseases. I think the plague even came along with them, our old friend Bubonic. And really hastened the decline and demise of according to some stories like millions of people. So in addition to all the trading and raiding, etc. that was happening, direct contact with these folks frequently brought with it exposure to devastating diseases. Diseases that wiped out cultures that may have persevered perhaps for generations further, even in a state of decline, absent that sort of biological component, that biological... Uh, threat component, that of the germs, viruses, disease. Yep. So we've got our plague component in this story here in 2020. I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, so the the 
Wikipedia on the Mesoamerican pre-Columbian, uh, the pre-Columbian era, excuse me. Incredibly detailed, incredibly informative, uh, highly recommended. It's one of the better uh, Wikipedia articles that I've seen here. They have it listed as part of a series on human history, the human era. Um, there's a bunch of great citations on this document itself, just this one article. So check that one out. Let's, having acknowledged the existence of the Mississippian culture that was more or less wiped out, paving the way for the European explorers to contact what were already remnant nations of the Mississippian culture who actually became more tribal in a almost direct response to the arrival of the Europeans. Europeans showed up. They had gunpowder. They had textiles and spices from Europe. They had printed books. They had literally a language and alphabet that they were trying to proliferate in the North American continent and would at every opportunity begin that exchange of linguistic tools trying to establish history and hegemony with one another. Uh, as a result of this, many of these newly identified, self-identified tribal nations quickly had to sort of pick a side for themselves if they wished to really get an advantage over their neighbors. Obviously, the gunpowder and, and the prospect of rifles alone at this point in history in North America could change the course of an entire nation's history, an indigenous people's nation's history. They could become a superpower in their own region by having this sort of technology and by having the powerful friends that arrived on boats over the Atlantic. So we go from the pre-Columbian era Wikipedia article to another excellent Wikipedia article about the timeline of European colonization of North America. And again, I love sources like this because it's right here for anybody. Um, nothing that I've encountered in these couple of articles, nor the Roanoke article, which will also come from Wikipedia that we'll be moving on to in a moment, uh, told me anything super new or different than I knew previously. Again, this is a pet subject of mine, so I've always sort of, I've watched every little silly history channel documentary about this over the years or anything else that's come along that I can see and read every little story that gets bubbled across my feed whenever Roanoke pops up. Just always have, right? Was captivated when I was seven and heard about this for the first time. Uh, never went away. If you'll indulge me, I'm going to take a quick puff. I hope you're having a session with me here today already and are feeling the richness of this story already. We're just just getting started. Always a good time to make sure you're recording, Steve. So again, hanging out on Wikipedia because we love it, because it's a place for you to go to. We can critique it if we want. We can easily move 
beyond it if we need to. So far, today, for our purposes, it's doing really good for us. Um, got a lot of detail here in all these articles, and we will be jumping out of Wikipedia to a couple of helpful supplemental locations as well. I'm telling you, this Roanoke just gives and gives. So, again, we're getting context right now for the colony. And now we're going to look at the timeline of the European colonization in North America because I want you to understand we, so many of us, get this story presented to us as something that's like the first British settlement in North America. Like this was some deserted, undiscovered, untrammeled, barely conceived of outpost that no one was there before these people. Not only were we there, we were over there fucking shit up for years already. And to the natives, whether you're Spanish or whether you're British, pretty, I mean, it's six of one, half and a dozen of the other kind of potato potato situation, right? Uh, white whack jobs with thunder sticks on big, awesome boats coming over for the last you know better part of 100 years if you go back to the earliest visits every time they came they brought drama every single time okay so the natives had a extremely dynamic relationship with these people that was already robust at the time of Roanoke's founding. In the 16th century alone, and bear with me here as I lapse into a speed reader recitation for you here, I'm going to give you the highlights of, actually, we'll start at the late 15th with our good friend Columbus, Only to point out that, like, almost 20 years before Columbus, 19 years before Columbus, João Vaz Corte Real was reported to have just about landed in Newfoundland. Okay, so that's another European who was in Newfoundland at the land of codfish 20 years before Columbus, somebody we never hear about. And Columbus... We all know 1492, Nina, Pinta, Santa Maria Mission, okay? In 1492, Columbus makes it to the Bahamas, Cuba, and Hispaniola. He establishes a city on Hispaniola, La Navidad, destroyed the following year by natives. 1493, the colony of La Isabella is established on the island of Hispaniola. Maybe that thing survives for a while. 1493, again, Columbus makes it to Puerto Rico. 1494, Columbus goes to Jamaica. 1496, Santo Domingo, the first European permanent settlement, is built. Okay, so we have a permanent European settlement in 1496. Roanoke is 1587. So it's 89 years ahead of Roanoke there in Santo Domingo. 1497, John Cabot reaches Newfoundland. 1498, in his third voyage, Columbus reaches Trinidad and Tobago. 1498, La Isla is abandoned by the Spanish. La Isabella, excuse me, abandoned by the Spanish. So that colony lasts five years. 1499, João Fernandez Labrador maps Labrador and Newfoundland. Now we're in the 16th century, the century of the Roanoke Expedition. 1501, Corte Real brothers explore the coast of what is today the Canadian province of Newfoundland, Labrador. 1502, Columbus sails along the mainland coast of South Yucatan and reaches present-day Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. 1503, Las Tortugas, noted by Columbus in passage throughout the Western Caribbean, present-day Cayman Islands. 1508, Ponce de Leon founds Capara on San Juan Batista, now Puerto Rico. 
1511, Conquest of Cuba begins. 1513, Ponce de Leon in Florida. 1515, four years later, Conquest of Cuba completed. 1517, San Francisco Hernandez de Cordoba lands on the Yucatan Peninsula. 1590, 1519, founding of Villa Rica de la Veracruz, Veracruz. 1521, Hernán Cortés completes the conquest of Mexico. 1521, Juan Ponce de Leon tries and fails to settle in Florida. 1524, Pedro de Alvarado conquers present-day Guatemala and El Salvador. 1524, Giovanni da Varazano sails along most of the East Coast. 1525, Estevao Gomez enters Upper New York Bay. 1526, Lucas Vasquez de Alion briefly establishes the failed settlement of San Miguel de Guadalupe in South Carolina, the first site of enslavement of Africans in North America and of the first slave rebellion. So at this time, 1526, some 50 some odd years before the Roanoke colony, Europeans are all over the East Coast. They're in the islands of Cuba and Puerto Rico, Trinidad, Tobago, the Bahamas. They're in the Florida Keys, the aforementioned Mississippian culture, though declining, is only now catching their diseases and beginning to be impacted from the contact from the Europeans. They still exist, and they have trade networks that we know span the continent, east and west, and north and south. They're in communication, probably, and have existing trade relations of different kinds with these Mesoamerican cultures being conquered by the Spanish in Central and South America. They should. So, setting the tone for understanding of the nature of the relationship between the coming colonists, air quotes, and the indigenous peoples. 1527, fishermen are using the harbor at St. John's, Newfoundland, and other places on the coast. 1535, Jacques Cartier reaches Quebec. 1536, Cabeza de Vaca reaches Mexico City after wandering throughout North America. 1538, failed Huguenot settlement on St. Kitts in the Caribbean, destroyed by the Spanish. 1539, Hernando de Soto explores the interior from Florida to Arkansas. 1540, Coronado travels from Mexico to eastern Kansas. I promise you we're almost to the colony here. 1540, the Spanish reached the Grand Canyon. In parentheses next to this, I love this note. The area is ignored for the next 200 years. So great. 1541, failed French settlement at Charlesburg Royal, Quebec City, by Cartier and Robert Val. 1542, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo reaches the California coast. So in 1542, Europeans had already touched the west coast of North America. 1559, failed Spanish settlement at Pensacola, Florida. Still having a lot of trouble in Florida during this time. 1562, failed Huguenot settlement in South Carolina. Charles Fort, Santa Elena site. 1564, French Huguenots at Jacksonville, Florida, Fort Caroline. 1565, Spanish slaughter French heretics at Fort Caroline. 1565, Spanish found St. Augustine, Florida. 1566, 1587, Spanish in South Carolina, Charles Fort, Santa Elena site. These Carolinas are important to us because this is very close to the Roanoke Island site and Cape Hatteras, later Hatteras Island. 1568, Dutch revolt against Spain begins. The economic model developed in the Netherlands would define colonial policies in the next two centuries. 1570, failed Spanish settlement on Chesapeake Bay. Ahakan mission. 1576, Martin Frobisher reaches the coast of Labrador and Baffin Island. 1579, Sir Francis Drake claims New Albion. 1583, England formally claims Newfoundland. 
1585, failed English settlement on Roanoke Island, North Carolina. Lost colony. So, here they report, 1585, failed English settlement on Roanoke Island, North Carolina, and then in parentheses, lost colony. It's a one-liner, and yet the one-liner indicates to us a discrepancy from a date I already gave you of 1587 earlier, and that's because the famous lost colony of Roanoke is the lost 108 or 113, depending on where you look, lost colonists and, and how you count, I guess, lost colonists of the 1587 group. That's right. That was the second Roanoke colony because there was already a first one that failed in like under a year that was founded just two years prior in 1585. So let's move further over to a great document that I found on a really weird and antiquated like looking like this is like some really sweet old not really not quite GeoCities era but like just a really homegrown HTML site uh, on sites.google.com which I feel like I've heard of but I don't know much about like how this is I don't know if you like host your own site on Google uh, through Google or something um, and if this is just an individual who did this or um, who these folks are uh, but we won't uh, look too hard except to look at this amazing account they have of 1585 and the first Roanoke colony. So, like always, the link for this one is going in the show notes for you so that you can read this uh, particular article and enjoy whatever else this site has to offer for history for us because this is pretty good stuff here. In January 6th, 1585, I promised you we were going to get to the story. I told you it was going to take a while, though, didn't I? So, yeah, I hope you're smoking. <laughs> Sir Walter Raleigh, we've all heard of this guy, right? He's knighted by Queen Elizabeth, who appoints him lord of the new territories that he will discover in North America. February 1585, one month later, Queen Elizabeth grants a charter to Adrian Gilbert, the young brother of Sir Humphrey Gilbert, allowing him to sail to the north, northwest, and northeast with, and they say here, so many ships as he could, with the aim to colonize all the lands that he will discover in order to set up a trade monopoly. Very plain language there. Sir Humphrey Gilbert and Martin Frobisher's failures had not appeased the enthusiasm of those who sought to find the Northwest Passage. Adrian Gilbert, philosopher John Dee, and Secretary of State Sir Francis Walsingham had joined for further research. They'll organize several expeditions in this purpose, but none will achieve results. So everybody at the top of the British corporate organizational structure of the era is already carving up North America mentally. They're not necessarily achieving these aims, but on paper, this is where they're going and no less uh, august personages is personages as those just mentioned including John D philosopher slash wizard to the queen were had stakes in this okay make of that what you will April 9th 1585 the five ship expedition commanded by Sir Walter Raleigh's cousin Sir Richard Grenville remember that name, Grenville, newly appointed general of Virginia, leaves Plymouth with a group of 600 would-be settlers and sets sail to Roanoke, North Carolina. Okay, again, Roanoke, North Carolina, Roanoke Island, Hatteras, Cape Hatteras, and Hatteras Island, which it became over time as weather brought in and closed the sandbar that used to be the Cape and then they probably landfilled over it after that, right, at some point to make it permanent f to this day, because it's still an island today. Um, 
All those Spanish settlements were right around this area, the ones we were just enumerating in the other article. Spanish settlements, again, air quotes, like Spanish raiding parties and, <laughs> you know, conquerors, conquistadors, literal conquistadors, right? They, they got that name for a reason. Uh, so again, any natives you encounter are going to be extremely wary of you at this time already no matter who you are nobody they've met yet has been anything other than dangerous uh, deceptive you know exploitative and or deadly nevertheless they keep trying to trade and enter into something resembling civil discourse with these people. Possibly because the writing was on the wall and you knew they weren't going to stop coming. Putting yourself in the shoes of the indigenous. So you gotta, some of you gotta figure out how to deal with these people. Because again, they're not going to stop coming. So. Grenville, remember the name. They leave Plymouth. That's Plymouth, England, okay? Not Plymouth, Plymouth Rock, okay? Um, they leave Plymouth with a group of 600 settlers to sail to Roanoke, North Carolina. They've got some boats here. They tell us about them, just like the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. They're important for us to know the names of the boats for whatever reasons, right? <laughs> with its 140 tons, the Tiger, commanded by Sir Richard Grenville himself, was also the biggest ship. Do remember the Tiger, though, because it's important. The others being the Roebuck. Sears and Roebuck, anybody? 140 tons. John Clark, captain. The Red Lion. Hmm, Red Lion Inn. Just realized that. 100 tons. Owned and operated by George Raymond, a merchant adventurer from Chichester. The Elizabeth and the Dorothy. Among the present officers were both veterans, Philip Amadas and Simon Fernandino. Ferdinando. Excuse me, Simon Ferdinando, but also Thomas, Thomas Cavendish, who was later going to become the third sailor to perform a full world tour, John Arundel, Grenville's half brother, and John Stukely, his brother in law. I take the time to relate this to you to belabor the point of the fact that they go on to tell us the further members of this troop, cousins and friends of. Walter Raleigh, including Richard Gilbert, a Courtenay, a Prideau, Ralph Lane, and Anthony Rose. There were finally an illustrator, John White. I believe Courtenay and Prideau are just surnames, and the people's first names are lost to history or something. There were finally an illustrator, John White. He would later be the governor of the second colony. Uh, John White, two scientists, Thomas Harriot and Robert Hughes, and among the most humble, an Irishman named Darby Gland. Both Indians, Winchese and Monteo, were part of the trip. Both of those names are important as well, Winchese and Monteo. The chosen route was to pass Canary Islands and the Spanish West Indies. Uh, my point about that is the Europeans coming over, as well as the Spaniards before them, were close-knit Groups of lesser royals and aspiring elites of different, d differing degrees. Uh, this was always the moneyed people, the people of means that went on these missions, sometimes very militaristic and warlike parties. In the case of the Roanoke expeditions of 1585, and in particular 1587, much more uh, merchant, uh, commercial, and enterprise-oriented. They were intending to, in this case, uh, represent interests that would were mainly aiming to extract resources and profit. In particular, in 1587, that group thought they were going to find things like gold and diamonds, um, which they, to their shock and dismay, 
did not find, nor did they find copper or garnets or anything else <laughs> of that nature. In fact, they were quickly realized they had to shift gears and look at the real resources of the uh, region that they had found themselves in, which were, of course, things like, at the time, lumber and what they could produce from the earth beneath them in the form of crops, namely things like tobacco, etc. Um, so, relatives, cousins, etc., who many of whom would go on to, you know, I don't know if it was coincidence about the roebuck and the red lion, um, but these are names that we see perpetuated down through history, some of them some others of them in other parts of these stories, maybe people who had descendants who were founding fathers, so to speak. Back to it. May 12, 1585. After suffering a storm in the Bay of Portugal, Greenville's fleet casts anchor in Mosquito Bay, Puerto Rico. The Roebuck and the Red Lion have followed other routes. Greenville orders the building of a fort and the fitting out of a small smithy. He asks also his men to build a new rowboat intended to replace the one lost in the gale. I love this. These guys are so well equipped and so capable that they can land in this foreign land, uh, set up shop, build fortifications quickly, and have the wherewithal to set up a smith and put them to work. And literally they do indeed construct a new boat out of nothing but materials they procure there on site in Puerto Rico. Uh, a boat that it's not a little canoe or dinghy either. Uh, these are boats that can like hold 10 or 15 people and can be rowed or have sails in them. This, this article doesn't really give that uh, level of detail right there in that paragraph about it, but it's that the boat they built wasn't a joke that they lost in, in a storm previously, the replacement. So uh, just a moment of respect for that level of uh, capability out of this troop. Tired of waiting in vain, the missing ships... Uh, waiting in vain, I think the, the word is missing for, for the missing ships, the Raleigh expedition left Puerto Rico in late May, not without having previously set fire to the fort and surrounding woods, nor forgetting, by the way, to loot two Spanish frigates, illustrating the fact that England and Spain were virtually at war. The open conflict was going to burst only three years later, but at that time, the British felt involved in a sort of Cold War coming from that already based in Florida, Spain saw unfavorably the English colonial attempts in the North American continent. Shocker. Their ambitions went against the Spaniards' interests, who feared they would directly affect their trade with the New World. And it was obvious that such possibility was essential for Raleigh and Grenville, who hoped seriously to finance their colonial program by piecemeal privateering against the Spanish galleons. So, that's an admission right there that Raleigh and Grenville were pirates. Privateer is synonymous with pirate. It's a pirate with a license from your queen. That's all. June 1st, 1585. Having reached the island of Hispaniola, the English fleet casts anchor in the port of La Isabella, where Greenville invites the inhabitants to go aboard the Tiger. June 3rd, 1585, the Spanish governor agrees Greenville's invitation to have dinner at his table and goes aboard the Tiger. This one felt flattered of his attention and allowed back Greenville and his men to get all the supplies required for their settlement. Horses, mares, cows, bulls, goats, pigs, sheep, sugar, etc. So they had to trade for a lot of serious stuff. All their meat provisions, obviously. All their animals for husbandry and for exploration in the form of the horses, right? Um, et, and they say etc. So that could have included pack animals and others. So, and all sorts of other provisions. June 8th, 1585, Grenville. I'm telling you, Grenville, you guys. This guy's trouble. And his men leave La Isabella 
to the Bahamas from where they have to set sail to North American coasts. June 16, 1585. The Red Lion, commanded by Captain George Raymond, arrives at Cape Hatteras. About 30 men are landed on Croatoan Island, looking forward to the other boats of the Raleigh expedition, while Raymond decides for his part to leave to Newfoundland for a privateering campaign. So, as a reminder, Cape Hatteras, later to be known as Hatteras Island, was a narrow cape, like a little more than a sandbar, right at like the center of the landmass that was, you know, divided and named as North Carolina and South Carolina, uh, the portion of the continent. That, as you look at the east coast of the United States, you'll notice that it's kind of like the big belly of the east coast's seaboard line. Um, for North America. And so it's sort of like hitting like center mass, you know, uh, in a lot of ways. And Jamestown's just like 100 miles, maybe 200 miles at most to the north of where this is, Cape Hatteras. Uh, you sail through a little narrow opening at Cape Hatteras that later closed off with sand, you know, um, from the tides and became Hatteras Island. When you sailed through the Cape, though, while this was still open at this time, and passable by pretty deep-keeled ships, obviously, uh, but it was dangerous. It was a dangerous little Cape. Uh, you got to a very sheltered area where several islands were, including a Croatan Island and Roanoke Island. So when you look at detailed maps of this, this is where all this is taking place, Okay. North Carolina, South Carolina, border, uh, Dare County, I think, is in North Carolina. Dare County is in Virginia, actually, like on the edge of those, uh, on the edge of North Carolina and Virginia. So, back at it. They're at Cape Hatteras, the Red Lion. I really am interested to know if there's a connection to the Red Lion in about 30 men are landed on Croatan Island, Croatoan Island, looking forward to the other boats of the Raleigh expedition, while Raymond decides for his part to leave for, to Newfoundland for a privateering campaign. Okay, so I did repeat that for you a little bit, but Grenville's fleet had been dispersed further to a storm off the Bay of Portugal, and the Red Lion had since followed another route. So that's how they ended out there on their own. June 20th, 1585, the Raleigh Expedition set sails along the coasts of Florida. June 26th, 1585, the expedition reaches Wokokan Island, today Okra Koke, south of Cape Hatteras. Fateful day here. On June 29th, 1585, despite his pilot's skills, they say, I love that, <laughs> Simon Fernandino fails to steer properly the Tiger when crossing the Wokokan Inlet and causes an important water leak, damaging the major part of the provisions. So, whose fault was this? Was this Simon Fernandino, a maybe captain of the ship? Was it his unnamed pilot? Or was it Grenville, the leader of the expedition, who we know to have been aboard the Tiger and been leading a merry chase around the eastern seaboard, raiding Spanish ships and landing wherever he wanted. They seriously fucked up their boat here. <laughs> they had over like a year of provisions. Here we go. The incident was even more disastrous than while provisions had initially than that. The, another missing word than that. Comma. While provisions had initially to allow the colony to survive for a year, what was left ensured its livelihood for barely a month. Okay, so everything went rotten. They almost sank the ship. They had a fraction of their reserves. Fernandino caused accordingly a lot of resentment among the colonists. No shit. <laughs> July 27th, 
July 3rd, 1585, Grenville sends Win Chase, all right, and now desperate Grenville, they should say, and a small company to inform King Wingina of their arrival. Unlike Monteo, here's why this is important. Win Chase, you'll recall, you probably don't recall, but I'll remind you, he's one of two natives who uh, the Europeans had already. They don't. They don't make this clear until right here. They more or less kidnapped these guys. Had already dragged them all the way to Europe and back to present them to the queen and stuff. They had them over there for months, and then sailed them back. Winchese, unlike Manteo, who was rather well accustomed to the English manners, Winchese had never really agreed to be carried, despite him, to England. Right, never really agreed to be carried despite him. So what he's saying is he didn't want to go. They took him despite himself. He was kidnapped to England, and he had just arrived at Dasa Manquapequec. That that's a city name. Excuse me, did my best. That he hastened to chase away his accompanists, and informed his tribe that the newcomers were not as trustworthy as they believed, or as they would present themselves either. So Winchese raised the alarm. And again, that story that he would have told that day to his people would have been repeated, would have been uh, handed over to messengers who would go out and do their usual communication with their neighbors, friendly and, you know, slightly contentious. Nevertheless, they were all, to some extent at this point in time, still to an extent communicating with one another about their continuous like fraught contact with the Europeans so great paragraph there in this story pointing out that Winchese was not feeling it he had been kidnapped he was uh, you know they thought they still had him under control they thought that you know he was their boy and uh, as soon as he got back within running distance of of his people he was out of there uh, and telling everybody to not trust these guys so July 6th 1585 John Aradell is sent with Monteo to Croatoan Island where they find the men landed shortly before from the Red Lion July 11th 1585 Grenville leaves for exploration in the mainland accompanied with about 60 men and the Indian, Monteo. July 12, 1585, they visit the village of Pamiayok, where lives Pamiakum, Wininga's rival. John White makes on this occasion spectacular watercolor sketches of the town with log houses and par- palisades around it. Excuse me, long houses and, and a palisade around it. Uh, nice inset here of that uh, John White painting. July 13th, 1585, they go to Aqua Skogok. Two days later, on the 15th of July, 1585, Grenville and his men are welcomed at Sekotan. Okay, so here again we get to another juicy part, though. To me, this is absolutely part of the same story as the true lost colony which we don't tend to get emphasized at all in our in our learnings about it it's really kind of glossed over and sped through in school like a perfunctoriness about the level of depth i mean what can you do you're in school they're not going to go super deep it's elementary school for a reason i get it of course this comes back up again in middle school and high school you know your your teachers get another crack at it later on so you get it a couple times before you're done but here we are in july 1585 granville soon to be the infamous Grenville. Unlike the previous year, the Indians remained divided on the reception to be reserved to the foreigners. Their return had been preceded by strange phenomena as a total solar eclipse and the appearance of a comet. But the most worrying came from the insidious arrival of a disease which recently began to decimate the 
autochinous population. I've seen that word before. Adjective autochinous. Adjective of an inhabitant of a place. Indigenous rather than descended from migrants or colonists. It's a mouthful. Autochinous. Autochthonous. Whew. Okay. July 16th, 1585. Sir Richard Grenville sends Admiral Philip Amadas to Aguas Aguacoscoc to get back a silver cup stolen during his visit. You heard that right. He sent an admiral to go after a silver cup that he... Cl I'm putting quotes around stolen. All right, Grenville's desperate. He's been desperate for a little while already. The Indians were already showing him that they're a little cagey about these guys. On top of it all, they've got celestial signs, comets, and plagues impacting them, not only from a philosophical outlook standpoint, but from a physical impact standpoint. So their hosts are a little bit hurting anyway, on top of having a pretty dim view of these guys based on past behavior. Am I painting a picture for you here yet? So that he sends an admiral to get back a silver cup stolen during his visit. The Indians, not being decided to do so, or maybe not even able to do so, because this silver cup could be complete, absolute malarkey. The order is given to chase away all the inhabitants and to set on fire the village and the corn crops. Sir Richard Grenville, everybody. Knight of the Realm. Grenville triggered the Secotan's anger by not hesitating to sack and make burn down the whole village of Aquascogoc for the simple theft of a silver cup. What ordered Grenville reflected that the English culture was unable to consider the natives otherwise than as savages and treat them on equal footing. July 21st, 1585. Leaving Wokokon, Grenville set sail following the Outer Banks, northbound up to Roanoke. He meets Granjanamio, King Wingina's brother, in Dasa Monquepequeque, and asks him to allow his group to settle in the north of the island. July 27th, 1585, Grenville anchors at Hataraske, not far from the strip of coastal dunes at a short distance from Roanoke. There was then a real tension between officers and gentlemen and mainly between Sir Richard Grenville and Ralph Lane, a veteran allied to Sir Francis Walsingham, who was less concerned with the founding of a colony than to engage fight against the Spaniards, which he judged the strengths rather weak. The colony finally settled in the northern end of Roanoke Island, and Ralph Lane was appointed the first governor. He sent a letter to Philip Sidney, the son-in-law of Walsingham, who closely followed the New World's exploration, informing him about the success of the expedition. In another letter to Richard Hacklett, geographer and historian, the new governor of Virginia pointed out that he was really impressed by the immensity of the, uh, this unknown continent. He added that if the colony had horses and cows in reasonable quantities and was inhabited by Englishmen, no realm of Christendom would be comparable to it. The Indians he described naively as courteous and eager to wear clothes, seemed chiefly interested in red copper. Their leader, Wingina, received the English with hospitality and cooperated with them at the beginning of their settlement. I would say that description is more condescending than naive, but fine. August 25th, 
1585, Grenville returns to England for provisions. He leaves on Roanoke 107, 107 men, led by new governor Ralph Lane. So, Grenville left. He left a rival in charge with 107 men. On the way back, so this is this is Colony 1, really, that 107 people. On the way back, Grenville seized a Spanish galleon, the booty of which was used to pay off generously costs incurred during the expedition. So again, piracy. Upon his revive, arrival in England, he reports to Walsingham, who confirmed him all the interest of the Queen to his project and insisted on the, quote, national character of the Virginian venture. According to Ralph Lane, a general as general of Virginia, Grenville was especially noted by his brutality and his tyrannical conduct. I'm glad to see it pointed out explicitly here. He relied on the foresight of Sir Walter Raleigh to move him aside from the project of colonization, for his pride and immoderate ambition had more endangered the settlement than contributed to its safety. To underscore the value and perceived value of the new world to these people. We will continue to take note from this article here on sites.google.com, a timeline of America. September 3rd, 1585, Ralph Lane, that rival to Grenville, left behind in Roanoke, writes a letter to Richard Hakulut describing the new colony as, quote, the goodliest and most pleasing territory of the world. Lane built a redoubt he called Fort Raleigh, whose remains were still visible in 1896. It was located near the shore on the east coast of Roanoke between the northern point and a rather wide cove used as mooring for small boats. Okay, so Fort Raleigh, when you visit Roanoke today, there'll be a historical marker where Fort Raleigh has been reconstructed in a very awesome, I found, bastion, star fort style um, type of construction out of earthworks in this case, not uh, Tartarian red brick, but a bastion fort nonetheless, and nevertheless a small one. Uh, I may share that image on Instagram of a cool depiction I found of that fort because that that's fun stuff so follow me there if you want to see that kind of thing baked in a week just like everywhere else so Fort Raleigh that's where you, you know a site that you're going to see to this day a uh, reconstruction but the fort looked like one previously built in Puerto Rico forming a square strengthened by fitted out bastions in the middle of every side hence the stars the house the houses of the first settlers were nearby. They were, according to their occupants, simple but decent. Roofs were thatched and chimneys as foundations were to be brick-built, according to Darby Glenn's testimony. Vestiges discovered nearby in 1860, and recent excavations have indeed unearthed the remains of bricks, probably going back up to the Elizabethan time. Bricks. My Tartarian friends, bricks. <laughs> Thomas Harriet found that there was no stone on the island, but the presence of clay could serve to make bricks, and it was possible to obtain lime from oyster shells deposits, as were particularly in England on the islands of Tennet and Sheppey. As the searches were not, however, able to highlight the significant use of brick, it is reasonable to assume that the main construction material was wood. Richard Hackult, Hackult, in his Discourse of Western Planting, wrote that the will of Sir Walter Raleigh, dictated in 1584, one year before the start of the expedition, was to have it mostly composed with expert hands in the art of fortification, people knowing how to manufacture blades and shovels, shipwrights, carpenters, brickworkers, tile makers, whitewashers, masons, masons, roofers, thatchers, etc., it is assumed that the buildings erected at Roanoke by the craftsmen were widely inspired by traditional English cottages. Relationship with the natives was initially friendly, although the English settlement was not to everyone's taste at the tribe's council. The Indians made sewings and laid fish traps, fish weirs, they 
created these for the colonists to help them actually secure enough food. Uh, while the colonists used their diplomatic skills to convince their leader, Weninga, to farm at the same time his lands on Roanoke and those around Desamonquepec so that they could supply them if the settlement grew. So that they could supply them if their settlement grew. So, yeah, of course their settlement was going to grow, right? That was their plan. The coast was explored to the south until Secaton, 80 miles, and to the north until Chesapeake, 130 miles. So south, 80 miles, north, 130 miles. Thomas Harriot gathered information on plants, animals, and stones. John White, remember that name, he'll be come back around again, made inimitable watercolor paintings of the Secaton life in Roanoke and the coast. He, see, he had already depicted that one town earlier that uh, Grenville went on to um, destroy. The settlers had also learned to smoke tobacco by using Indian pipes. It is unclear to what extent the first settlers conformed to the criteria laid down by Richard Hakluyt. I'm telling you guys, H-A-K-L-U-Y-T. Hakluyt. Hakluyt. Let's call it Hakluyt. But records tell that there were experts in fortification, brickmakers, carpenters, and roofers. This is no wonder they could make a boat. You know, they could rebuild boats out of the freaking dirt and twigs uh, and keep rocking. They had they literally brought a nation building contingent, didn't they? We also know the name of the colonists. Thomas Harriet teaches us that some of them were highborn citizens who became fast nostalgic of their cozy bed and delicate food. Here's important elements. Others, according to Lane's testimony, were excellent soldiers. There were also people of humble condition of whom Darby Gland had to be the representative, and who, although Irish, had certainly taken part in the expedition without having really chosen. What does that mean? Another shanghai member of this expedition? They actually say here, This expedition looked more like a military campaign than a genuine settlement. The season progressed, and it was not only too late to plant, but none of the colonists was much of a farmer. Accordingly, they depended on both Indians and England for their supplies. Staples such as salt, horses, cattle, had been mostly acquired from the Spaniards, the same people they were raiding and killing, by the way, at other moments, through negotiation, but also by force. Okay, so obviously, again, acquired from the Spaniards by like raiding their ships on the water especially it appeared that there was no women in the group to imagine a real future to the colony they just sent the boys this article this excellent article uh, was written by someone named Gerard Tondu and it appears to have been published originally August 22nd 2013 so uh Gerard Tondu, wonderful work, Google Sites, what a quaint and hilarious location to find ourselves on this expedition. Uh, so now that we've gone all the way through the groundwork for the 1587 colony, and the fact that 109 rough and tumble pirates were more or less the contingent that were that made up the initial Roanoke expedition. We will better understand what happened in 1587. We'll return now briefly to my own handwritten notes about this story. as we come to the 1587 campaign. The disappearance of the Roanoke colony remains one of the oldest unsolved mysteries in North American colonial history. The 1587 campaign by John White to establish a British colony in North America was financed by Sir Walter Raleigh. The location was to be one Roanoke Island. 
just off the coast of North Carolina. They landed that July and established themselves rather quickly. Everything seemed to be going well for the thriving colony of 115 people. In fact, John White's daughter, Eleanor Dare, gave birth to a daughter while in Roanoke. Virginia Dare became the first English child born in the Americas. If you've ever heard of the Dare Stones, they are a set of stone tablets discovered in the 1800s, said to have been left behind by that very same Virginia Dare, and are considered to be closely related lore to the Roanoke story and ostensibly represent a one possible account of the fate of the lost colonists. So I've actually included a link to a video I watched on YouTube at the beginning of my research that I used to help like refresh my memory about the lost colony. And indeed, even I had sort of forgotten about the first colony, the 1585 colony, uh, honestly, when I sat down to create this episode. One of the videos in particular, uh, I, I give you two. One's actually like a longer detailed account, and it's all audio, but it's also on YouTube. But this shorter video is only like a nine-minute or 11-minute thing. It's perfect. Um, uh, and it's like seven wild theories that you may not have known about Roanoke, okay? Um, so they float some some really weird stuff. Including uh, a theory about, like, you know, cannibalistic natives eating them uh, after they were left behind for a resupply. Uh, internal strife among the settlers, again, in the three-year period between when um, White left and tried to return to come back to the colony. Things like the aforementioned disease, uh, a plague, uh, that, you know, like the one that had perhaps happened to the Mississippian people. Maybe one was passed back to the colonists, or maybe their own plague came with them and flared up under the rough conditions of the winter there. Uh, this video in particular was really neat because they made some interesting associations uh, between this mystery and some historical figures that were to come later that we all, you know, have some passing familiarity with. And here is a bit of a interesting, fun layer to the story that's, again, a little conspiratorial in a way. Um, just this, this coincidence of people that somehow are indelibly connected to this mystery. Uh, like who you ask. Um, how about Amelia Earhart, the famous aviator, who apparently, and I haven't seen the, the entry here with my own two eyes, but apparently she wrote the word Croatoan in her personal journal in 1937, the same year of her own famous disappearance. All right. Um, when she was attempting to circumnavigate the world in her plane. Uh, we have a famous train robber, Black Bart, who's associated with this story uh, from like the 1800s, uh, and he was said to have inscribed the word Croatoan in his jail cell wall. Um, similarly, the 19th century horror author, some people are really familiar with this guy. I've always heard his name. I've never really read much from him, but I'm interested in him now as a result of this story because it turns out... Uh, horror author and, uh, in his time, better known as a journalist, Ambrose Bierce, B-I-E-R-C-E, -E, right? You've heard this name before. Uh, apparently, again, with carving, carved the same word in his own bedpost or bed frame. And then this guy, who was in his 70s at this point, uh, soon afterward disappeared in Mexico, never to be found. 
He was like a weird adventurer in his later life. Uh, really weird. Like I read, uh, I went off on a huge Ambrose Bierce tangent researching this story. Uh, there was a ghost ship, a ghost ship from 1921. It was named the Carol A. Deering. I don't know. I haven't looked into Deering at all, but the boat was named Deering. The boat was a ghost ship. It had no crew. It ran aground on where? Hatteras Island or Cape Hatteras. It was still Cape Hatteras at the time. Um, they had Croatoan in their logbook. One of the last entries. Again, I didn't look at the logbook myself okay this is these are i guess secondhand sources at best yeah edgar allan poe i'm looking at my notes here still edgar allan poe the edgar allan poe mr halloween himself was said to have uttered the word aloud upon his deathbed all right and he was on his deathbed in what are were widely reported to be like delirious ramblings, okay? This guy was found in a shambles, having turned up, having been missing himself, okay? Uh, Poe went missing in Pennsylvania, and then like weeks later, two or three weeks later, was found in a gutter, quote-unquote, in the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, and then went on to like not recover and die and was mumbling about this lost colony on his deathbed. Um that could have been, you know, mere invention, or it could have been him intentionally trolling on his own deathbed. Wouldn't put it past a guy like Poe uh, to associate himself with such a mystery, right? So, uh, what's this about Croatoan? Well, as I said, John White, the leader of the expedition, left for England after just a few months. Their supplies were not what they needed them to be, not unlike the 1585 expedition. They were in a little better shape than the 1585 boys. But things were looking iffy. Relations with most of the locals, very dicey at best, when he left. John White, as we'll come to discover in the very last citation we have for this story and the best of all, left specific instructions to those he left behind in the colony on what to do in the event that they needed to evacuate from the location on the island. He asked them to carve a certain style of cross, a uh, something that looks to me a lot uh, superficially like the German Maltese cross, that flared cross. It's a little bit more elongated in this case, uh, but still equilateral. Uh, an old British cross uh, that the name of it escapes me. It might come up in the notes. but Or alternatively, to use a secret signet or secret code or otherwise carve indelibly the name of the location that they were trying to retire to uh, and to do it in a conspicuous place so that they could find it um, upon his return. So we know from many accounts that both the word croa or croat or crow, the portion was carved on a tree, but in addition to that, the entire word croatoan, both the name of an island and a local tribe were found carved upon the actual fort fortification wall that had been built in the time since John White left in late 1587. We're going to get the full details of his leaving and returning here in a book that I will be reading out of entitled Strange Stories, Amazing Facts. That is a old Reader's Digest book from, according to the publication date here, 1976. The Reader's Digest Association printed this book. Um, and it is a funny book that uh, a weird, uh, kooky, like, Aliens uh, truther, 
Yes, David Wilcock. Um, yeah, those of you who know him know how uh, out there he is. He's interesting. Uh, I wouldn't call myself a devotee of him or anything of that sort at this stage of uh, my life, but uh, I definitely enjoyed listening to him talk once upon a time on whatever different shows he was featured on, which you know I'm sure he appeared on History Channel and Discovery a million times in different forms. And uh, I don't know if Gaia is still a thing, but he was doing a Gaia series for a while. Uh, anyway, he credits this as being a book that he loved as a child and that set him off on his journey of exploration of the mysteries of the world. And uh, having my own strong childhood affinity to the Time Life books series that were so popular in the 1980s when I was a kid growing up and... Um, you know, being a child of the encyclopedia and family bookshelf as uh, I was, I thought to myself, oh, what a great book to get a hold of. I wonder if I can find this, you know, online. And of course, promptly found it at this point several years ago already on like half price books online or something like that and got a copy, nice hard cover copy of it shipped to my house for, I don't even know, under $10 whenever I got it. So, um, Found it to be a fun book in the finest tradition of all those old time life books. Uh, again, this one coming from the Reader's Digest people. But something about this story, you know, I haven't by any means read this book exhaustively since I got it. I, I flipped through it a few times for fun and literally shoved it up on the shelf and forgot about it almost as quickly as I uh, obtained it. Um, but I had a feeling that I would know about Roanoke, right? I just, I had a feeling I would. Or that there would be something in there about Roanoke uh, that I could discover something about it if I if I checked the index and looked in the book. Well, what do you know? On page three hundred and forty of Strange Stories, Amazing Facts, we find of all the resources that I found and cited and used just now that we've relied upon to get this far in the story, we find what I find to be perhaps the best uh, little tidbit about the entire Roanoke story. So uh, let's read about the Gray-Eyed Indians. How Raleigh's lost colony may have survived. Settlers driving inland along the Lumber River in North Carolina early in the 18th century were astonished to find a tribe of Gray-Eyed Indians whose native language was a kind of English. They claimed that their ancestors could, quote, talk in a book, which, the explorers understood, meant that they could read. Today, the descendants of these mysterious people still live in Robeson County, where they were discovered. Known as the Lumbee Indians, they have complexions ranging from dark to very fair. To this day, blonde hair and blue eyes are not uncommon. No one knows the tribe's true heritage, but an intriguing theory has been pieced together over the years. It is now thought that they may be the remnants of Sir Walter Raleigh's lost colony of Roanoke Island, from which all the English settlers disappeared in 1590. The Lumber River is about 200 miles from Roanoke. When Elizabeth I granted a charter to Raleigh, two attempts were made at colonization first was abandoned in 1586, so they got there in 1585, we've gone over that in detail, because of recurring Indian attacks and the shortage of supplies. Okay, recurring Indian attacks. <laughs> I don't know who attacked who, right? The party of more than 100 men and women, led by Governor John White, who arrived in 1587, fared little better. Eventually, White decided to sail back to England with a skeleton crew of 15 and seek help and supplies. He left instructions that if the remaining colonists were forced to leave in his absence, they should inscribe their destination, quote, in a conspicuous place. In my childhood, I don't know about yours, this story was very much presented, at least to the kids, as a big mystery. Nobody knows for sure if they were massacred or if they joined the natives, and if they joined the natives, if they did so willingly, or as prisoners, right? Story continues. Fortress ransacked. 
because of the war between England and Spain, it was not until 1590 that White was able to return. A fortress had been built at Roanoke, but it had been ransacked and then abandoned. The settlers had vanished without a trace. Only one clue remained, the single word, Croatoan, carved into a post. <clears throat> so they didn't find bodies at the Roanoke colony, by the way. So if they died of a plague, you know, uh, a lot of people would have gone unburied because not everybody would have been strong enough to, at a certain point, if you're all dying of a pandemic of some kind, you may not even have the strength to bury your own dead, right? Um, certainly the last of those folks, if they were left to die on their own, you know, might just be in their beds somewhere, but maybe not buried. Um, so, historians still argue over its meaning in 1976. Some believed it was the name of an Indian tribe that attacked the settlement and killed the colonists. Okay. Horse shit, right? <laughs> Baloney. We just read above, they were supposed to inscribe the destination in a conspicuous place, but somebody's going to say, nope, that was their killers. Okay. Um, but Croatoan was an island south of Roanoke, which the colonists knew was inhabited by the friendly Hatteras tribe. The same Hatteras by the name of Cape Hatteras and now Hatteras Island. If the colonists had managed to reach this island and then had intermarried with the Hatteras, their descendants could be today's Lumbee Indians. But they do better here in 1976 than we've seen anywhere else so far because they tell us Governor White assumed the settlers had moved to Croato involuntarily, but unable to search for them, he returned to England. When he came back, he, uh, didn't, he didn't come back till three years later. He didn't come back as captain of the next expedition. He was kind of a hostage of, uh, you know, he was a guest of another captain and a whole nother expedition and he was you know gonna get to resupply if he could find them if everything went good on their journey but of course these brits were in the middle of again privateering their way all the way across the ocean and it is it is enumerated in other stories that on this uh 1590 mission white was a guest of a expedition that literally pillaged their way out too, like out of England, they were attacking Spanish ships and on the open sea. And once they got to the new world, uh, they were there mostly to, uh, you know, do their uh, open seas piracy. Uh, and since they need to stop from time to time anyway to, you know, empty the bilge and take on new fresh food, etc., uh, they, of course, agreed to take a paying John White and all his provisions, you know, along as cargo. Um, that's how he got back. So he wasn't the boss of the trip in 1590 and didn't really get to take them or tell them where they couldn't go or stop or not stop. And uh, the ship's pilots wouldn't exactly let him go everywhere he wanted to go to search for them at that time in particular. So back to it, though. Unable to search for them, he returned to England. Now there is strong evidence to suggest that he was right. This is what we've been waiting for, everybody. About 1650. So 1587, 1650. I'm talking 70 years later, right? 67, something like that. Many Hatteras Indians, 63 years, migrated to the mainland. Settling in the Lumber River Valley. Okay, this is when we've got paperwork on these people. Started then. Of the 95 surnames of the, quote, lost colonists of Roanoke, names such as Samson, Cooper, and Dare, along with no fewer than 41 total, can be found among the Lumbees. So... 41 surnames associated with the original 95 recorded surnames that have been preserved are present in this tribe in 1976, according to Reader's Digest. So, I liked that. That felt 
conclusive to me. Uh, it felt settled. Um, as a postscript to the entire story, I'm going to link you to an article from August of 2020 in the New York Post online. This is not a paywalled article. I was originally going to read the entire article. I'm not going to now due to the depth that we took on the rest of this story. But great article about a book that was being published in 2019 called The Lost Colony and Hatteras Island. And I will read a couple of highlights from the story and point you at the whole thing because it's a great postscript to this. In 2019, the author Scott Dawson says here, they paraphrase that he sur surmises the colonial settlers were assimilated into the Croatan tribe on Hatteras Island. Later, the tribe was wiped out by smallpox. The upshot, the tribe was lost, not the colonists. Perhaps the um, members of the tribe who moved in in the 1600s to the mainland were the remnants of the smallpox decimated tribe, and therefore they needed to come in and sort of join the, the larger population on the mainland at that time, you know, coming out the other side of that plague. They go on, the book's bombshell is Dawson's allegation that the truth has always been known, but ignored because of racism. Quote, the mystery started in 1587 when over 100 English settlers arrived on Roanoke off the coast of North Carolina. Three years later, they vanished. The only clue to their whereabouts, the word Croatan, right? So we're not going to, we don't need to do that. We just did that. We see the famous drawings. The, uh, the story is a great story, though, and a quick, quick read. Uh, his conclusion that he drew from this and that the article does a pretty good job of just sort of saying without saying is that for a lot of reasons, especially today, this story of Roanoke and its lost colony continues to be allowed to be discussed in terms of it being a mystery. When in fact, it doesn't take much digging in very unusual places to come up with a very rich understanding of what happened in this particular case, what was known both at the time to the contemporaries of the colonists, to those one generation or so removed from them, and then for this story to fall out of public awareness and popular mythology of the uh, American, you know, nation building history era. Uh, to a resurgence in the 19th century when it became canonized in the modern mystery way and included in textbooks that are, you know, handed down to children. We still have, you know, amateur archaeologists funding their own DNA testing in 2016, 2018, 2019 to come up with the proof of what they're saying here about these so-called lost people. That was the gist of, of this story. This researcher uh, wrote a book based on some amateur archaeology they did, including DNA testing of descendants of the White family. Uh, people didn't allow for the possibility that these colonists were much other than 
massacred or, quote, assimilated, with the implication being that it wasn't really a voluntary assimilation by savages, therefore lost, not, uh, not, you know, the very correctly cowed former aggressors, colonizers, now in dire straits, abandoned by their own patriarch, uh, left to their own devices amongst natives whom they and their contemporaries from just a couple years before that, immediately setting the stage for their time with them, uh, badly misused many of those natives. Don't forget, Grenville burned a town right in that area. That, you know, how could we imagine that the natives would treat these people well or with any modicum of compassion uh, having been left behind like that? In fact, it served to be a wonderful example in the narrative of the bloodthirsty savages who deserve to have their land taken from them. by force or by deception, usually both, by both the British and the Spanish, the French where they could fit in. So, what other stories can you think of that are called mysteries today that upon looking into them a little deeper you see that in many ways what's called a mystery by one group of people you know is remembered explicitly as a terrible deed by another I don't know I mean I I hope it was worth it to listen to all that. I absolutely love the wildness of this story, the the palpable sense of danger and adventure that saturates the colonists' viewpoint. And then when you step back and look at it from the meta layer at all and you see what was going on, you think to yourself, wow, it's a hell of an adventure. You go, went ahead and chose for yourselves to go over there and murder a bunch of people while spreading disease and literally displacing them off of their entire continent. Yeah, I guess it's one of the one of the big stories at the beginning of one of the biggest story arcs that we get to learn about in history. And I guess I'm saying Roanoke was no mystery. What was going to happen there in 1587 was going to happen because of the Europeans' behavior in 1585 and in the decades preceding that in that same area. The Spanish contributed to the natives' dim view of the English, and the English, as they showed up, proved themselves every bit as detestable and untrustworthy as the Spaniards. Let's see who our writer was. Paula Fro Froelich on August 29th, 2020 for the New York Post story. 
Uh, again, we, you know, there's a lot more in that uh, story about the background on that book, and I did see that that book's available somewhere on Amazon. Uh, I, I think you can get that Lost Colony and Hatteras Island on Amazon. Uh, I'm sure you could probably also find it from a better, more reputable bookseller somewhere too. So, but link will be in the show notes to that story for you guys. Um, Roanoke Island. That's what's up. Um, in my opinion, great, great story. Uh, again, Virginia Dare supposed to have left behind the Dare Stones. Look into them. They're an incredible story in and of themselves. The first stone is widely regarded to possibly be authentic. Uh, the rest kind of in question. Virginia Dare herself is uh, rumored to be haunting Dare County in the form of a white deer. Yes, indeed. Dare, deer. See what they did there. Um, so, you know, for reasons like that, this story will never be allowed to pass out of the mystery category, right? In that part of the country today, the Roanoke mystery and Virginia Dare and the existence of the mythology surrounding those events at that time are maybe one of the biggest reasons anybody visits those, you know, particular historic sites, right? It's probably a local university or two that has a cottage industry of teaching on this part of history. So, um, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. This is this is uh, you know this is my version of a Halloween story, and it's a story I've wanted to talk about since I started the podcast. So, uh, and I'm so glad to finally get to look at it again in depth. And I was just so happy to find the story <clears throat> excuse me the story about the gray-eyed indians in strange stories amazing facts so thank you david wilcock for putting me onto that one right credit where credit is due uh speaking of credit where credit is due if you've made it this far i give you credit i love you i thank you for that I implore you, please check out the YouTube channel, Baked and Awake. If you haven't before, go watch my most recent interview from a uh, conversation, whatever you want to call it, uh, from like a week or so back. It's called the New Madrid Earthquakes of 1811 and 1812, and it's a discussion once again with Andreas Exertus and Philip Drujinin. It was a great, uh, great talk. The guys had great input for me, and... Um, always love having two such esteemed bigger channels dudes who are busy spend time with me and create you know unique experiences for our my listeners my audience um so show those guys some love and go through and subscribe to them in turn if you're not already and speaking of which again if you made it this far you're a real listener you're a real audience member and maybe you're even one of the many many, many new people that my friend and uh, YouTube like mentor and minor demigod John Levy recently sent with the most casual of comments and mentions uh, my way uh, about a week ago now and like 600 subscribers ago. And by contrast, guys, if you know, I think I celebrated here on the podcast for those of you who have been with me for a while when I hit 1,000 subscribers after three full years of grinding on YouTube on the podcast specifically to try to build my sub count, which was like 20 people when I started the podcast. Uh, so in one week, John Levy, by mentioning the Philip and Andreas interview conversation helped me grow my channel by more than half. So if you're one of those members of John's audience, uh, I, I humbly thank you for being here and I hope you stick around. It's mostly audio podcast content and probably always will be, but I'll always try to do some videos when I can and when I can like do a good job on them. Uh, in my opinion, for you guys, right? I try not to just put stuff out to put stuff out. Uh, I'll always try to do that for you is, is just try to bring some level of effort to the show. So um, thank you, John. Thank you to all my new Levy audience member subscribers. You've been a great 
addition to the audience and so stoked to have you. Um, finally, finally, I will remind everybody who listens to the podcast and uh, as I include in the show notes every time that any music you hear on the show is music that I have uh, secured proper rights to and permissions for reuse of uh, much of the music in the past that has been featured has been from such artists as Auntie Luode, who is always included in my show notes and is often gone back to uh, with his large library of music, uh, instrumental music for me. Uh, One Driven Official, many YouTube artists who have been made available to me through the YouTube Creative Commons uh, fair use license, uh, reuse license, it's not a fair use license, forgive me, as well as in today's episode, music from Life is CZ on YouTube, uh, which a uh, great beat that I was happy to secure the rights to to reproduce here on the podcast. Uh, CZ is a talented hip hop beat maker. And uh, again, if you made it this far, you really get the extra bonus content. Uh, I hope you'll hang around for just a moment to hear me badly attempt to rap over CZ's beat. Hope you guys have a amazing Halloween holiday, a safe one. Make it as fun as you can in this strange, strange climate. We know we're going to try. Uh, I've got trick or treat aging kids, so. We're going to have some fun both taking care of kids at the door and, and trying to work the neighborhood even under these conditions. So, um, And I hope that you include me in your holiday. Maybe towards the evening time. Maybe one of the later things you do today. I'm going to go to work now and try to get this out for you so you have it. Uh, maybe we'll spend some time together tonight, eh? After dark. All right. Until next time, you know what to do. Smoke some indica for me. And do shit anyway. I didn't know this beat was called the Riddler before I wrote this verse, but this is my questions rap, baked and awake. Up late, baked and awake, still seeking answers, still spotting fakes. It's been like this since I was in my teens. Asked my youth pastor things that were beyond his means. To ponder, let alone to answer. Questions like mine to the faith were a cancer. Thirty years later and I'm still on this path. Very few insights though. I'm no polymath. I got a brain a mile wide but maybe one inch deep. How's a man like me supposed to ever sleep? In this life that's so short and so hard and unfair, many only live to work and produce an heir. Is that the measure, the sole rate of success? These magic bank balances are kids' first steps? All right, that's fucked up. Those steps could be the key. Our kids, the reason to be who we were meant to be. Back in the day and way back when. Before all the bullshit, before all the pain, before I doubted myself, when I still trusted myself, when I was pushing myself, I was still feeling myself. But now I look in their eyes and what I see is myself. And all I want to do is give them all of myself. Even all the questions I never answered myself. As I wish them Godspeed, still not knowing what speed that was.